Hello, crew of Spaceship Earth. Uh, all of us have been wowed by what we've seen here uh, and heard for the last several days. Uh, and I think uh, I have been a, a, just an awed observer. But I'm going to shift gears now, and I'm talking about you as crew. Uh, it's no longer time for observer. I want you to understand that in what I'm talking about, you have skin in the game. Uh, the skin that you have may appear on the face of your grand, 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 granddaughter, uh, or it may be on your face right now. But in any event, uh, in the game that we're talking about here of planetary defense, you will have skin in the game. So uh, again, you are a crew of, of planet Earth, and I want to speak to you as if you are new to this game, which you probably are, in fact. So this is your initial summary briefing of this whole subject of what I call applied astronomy. We've been hearing all kinds of things about astronomy. Now we're going to go into applied astronomy, or what we call planetary defense. Now, you will have some homework in this course. Uh, that homework can be found quite easily, www.asteroidday.org. And so if you'll go there, you'll find the homework and you can fill in a lot of the details that we're going to have to go by very rapidly in this initial briefing. Um, so, all right, let's move on then. The, uh, this is what we're talking about. And of course, this is something which has happened a million times, millions of times in the history of the Earth. In fact, it's happened millions of times since life emerged on the Earth. That's astronomy. However, this also will happen in the future. That's astronomy. Or not, that's applied astronomy. So if we humans, if we crew of planet Earth, of spaceship Earth, do our job correctly, this will, in fact, never happen again. Just how do we bring that about? Well, let's talk about uh, your job and mine here in terms of planetary defense. And we'll talk about it uh, because there are these objects which we call near-Earth asteroids, which have been kicked out of the main belt by big Jupiter, uh, migrants, as it were, that now swoop into the inner solar system, and their orbits cross the orbit of planet Earth, and therefore, once in a while, we get hit. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the components of this. Um, if we want to protect our planet, we have to do three things. Uh, first, we have to have an early warning system. And that early warning system is there to tell us what's out there, what kind of an orbit it's in, and whether or not it poses a threat to the Earth, and if so, when, specifically to give us a prediction. Once we know something is coming at us, what we've got to do is have some capability to mitigate it. Now, mitigation we'll talk about in a few moments. Uh, but the third element, which is non-technical, is the most challenging. There has to be, you can have something coming at you. We can have something coming at us. It's not you, it's us. Uh, we can have something we can do about it, but there has to be a decision to act. And as you'll see, that's going to be the most challenging. So let's take them one at a time early warning. And this will all be a summary and I'll give you a kind of status report. In early warning you can see that we have been starting, if you look at the upper left curve, you can see it takes a bend upward in terms of discovery of these near-Earth asteroids starting in 1998. Uh, and it's been going up very steadily. We now have discovered uh, over 15,000 near-Earth asteroids. Uh, but if we look at the lower right chart, what you see there the largest ones are on the far right. Those are a kilometer in diameter and larger. And we have discovered 93% of them. And we, in that case, is principally NASA. NASA has done the bulk of that work. Others have contributed to it, including amateur astronomers. But as we move down toward the left, those are still very dangerous sized asteroids. And you can see as we go down to 300 to 1,000 uh, meters in diameter, uh, 60% we've discovered, 10%. Less than 1% of objects between 30 and 100 meters, and those are still very dangerous, and they're very numerous. 
So in terms of a summary of where we stand, the extinction level event, the extinction level objects that can hit us, we know about 93%, only 7% unknown. But if we go down to a continental disaster as opposed to a planet-wide disaster, we have 40% that we don't know about at all. When you don't know about something, you can't protect against it, and we would be hit. The first time we would know that these things exist is when they actually hit us. So we get down to a regional disaster, 90% of the potential threat out there is unknown, and when we get down to what we refer to as a city killer, that is, if it exploded, if it came in and hit directly over a city, it would wipe out that city and everything in it, the same as happened, if you will, in Tunguska, except there was no city there, but the size of the thing that hit in Siberia in 1908. There are a million of those objects out there, and we know less than 1% of those. So the challenge that we have if we're going to protect Earth, obviously, is we've got to discover everything down to and including uh, the tunguska size city killers. That's our goal. That's your goal as crew. To get there, we're going to have to launch an infrared space telescope because from the ground, we can't see these things. They are not bright. They're about the color of charcoal. And therefore, it takes very large telescopes. And the small ones, which are still very dangerous, we're not going to really be able to inventory from the ground. So we need to launch an infrared space telescope. And there are a couple of them that are in competition now, but I want to emphasize there's no real commitment at the present time anywhere in the world to, in fact, launch one of these infrared telescopes to work with telescopes on the ground to complete this inventory. So that's where we are in summary on early warning. Let's talk about mitigation. Well, mitigation, obviously, if you think about it, comes in two sizes. If we're talking about relatively small objects, then the obvious cost-effective thing to do, which, whether we like it or not, is the way the world works, the effect, cost-effective thing to do is civil defense or evacuate. We know how to evacuate. We do it all the time for things like hurricanes. But if they get above that size, if they get up to the city killer size, we're not going to want to see, you know, 8 million people die. So we need to look then at this issue of deflection. We think we know how to do this. I'll talk about that in a moment. But we've never done it. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right, what is deflection about? Well, deflection means you take an asteroid that's heading for an impact that you know 10 or 20 years from now, and you send up a space mission to it, and you slightly alter its state. You don't really change the orbit that it's in in, sen in the sense of the orientation of the orbit, and I'm just giving you the bottom line. If you go to homework, you can figure out what I'm saying here, but the secret here is we simply change the speed of the asteroid in its orbit very slightly. We either slow it down by hitting it in the front or we speed it up by hitting it from the rear end. Okay, it's like traffic accident on a freeway. We call this kinetic impact. Send up a rocket, can be sand or water, whatever, run into an asteroid and you're going to change its speed. You don't have to change it much. Something like 0 0.025 miles per hour. Okay? or 0 0.04 something kilometers per hour. So you don't have to change the speed much, but these things are pretty big. Now, if you run into one, that's going to do the job in the sense of missing the Earth, but you really need to end up in an exact new orbit. And so we need to have a system. One mechanism is what we've called a gravity tractor, and the gravity tractor can take uh, a brute force approximate uh, deflection uh, uh, from a kinetic impactor and make a small change to make the orbit precise. And we need that. I'm not going to tell you why. Again, your homework assignment. If the kinetic impactor is not large enough to make the necessary brute force change, we can call on the big dog. Nobody likes the big dog. Okay, Nobody likes to see nuclear explosions in space or nuclear weapons in space, but nevertheless, that could be available. Again, that's going to be an approximate deflection. It would also need a final trim to make a precision change. Okay, now 
there obviously will be new techniques in the future. Uh, these are techniques, technologies which exist today. We don't have to go into a big development. This costs $1.98, so to speak. Okay. But people have all kinds of ideas, and some of them will work, and some of them won't. You know, here's one. I leave it to you. Okay. So if we talk then about deflection, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to demonstrate it. The goal uh, is to have a demonstrated capability for reliable uh, and precise uh, asteroid deflection. Uh, how do we get there? We need to design and fund a sequence of actual asteroid deflections. Go up and do it. This is not theoretical. We're talking about your skin, my skin, our grandchildren's skin in the game. So we need to actually do this. And at the moment, there is one program that is projected to do this. It's a cooperative program between NASA and the European Space Agency called AIDA. I'm not going to describe it again. Uh, you can pick that up on your homework assignment. Uh, but it is not fully funded. And we have had several programs like this in the past that have reached this stage, and they have never, they've been left on the shelf. So we need to make sure, as crew, that these things get funded so that our skin is preserved. OK, now let's get to the really challenging one. This is a planetary decision process. All right, you may say, why planetary? I mean, if something's headed for an impact in the United States, well, the NASA will take care of it. If it's something in Russia, the Russians will take it, et cetera. Well, but this is not true. Zambia doesn't have a space program for one thing, and for another thing, as you'll see, this is a lot more complicated than that. Okay, so a planetary decision process is necessary because, for one thing, all places on Earth are vulnerable, obviously, to an asteroid impact. But far more important than that is the fact that any deflection, and we'll see this on the next slide, but any deflection will shift the impact risk across the face of the planet in the process of eliminating the risk by moving the impact entirely off the planet. Okay, now that's a very important thing. We'll come back to it, but you want to keep in mind that this is why we have to have a planetary decision. In fact, this fundamental challenge, which we're talking about, of preventing ourselves and our future uh, offspring from being dinosaurs, this is and will be when it comes, and it will, this will be a planet-wide threat which necessitates planetary, that is, collective decisions and actions, not individuals, nations. Okay. All right, now I want you as crew to picture yourself riding an asteroid that's headed toward the intersection of the orbit, uh, your orbit, and the orbit of the Earth. And here's the Earth. It's going to be coming into view here from the left. All right, it's moving rapidly from left to right. The intersection is, say, right in the middle of where the planet is now. But a few moments ago, Earth was to the left. The intersection was to the right. And if you go through that intersection before the Earth gets there, great, no problem. If, on the other hand, you arrive a bit late and the Earth is already through the intersection, again, no problem. But from the time the leading edge gets to the intersection till the trailing edge goes through it is about eight minutes. So there's eight minutes when the Earth is vulnerable on this potential impact. OK, so here's a plane of your orbit. You're riding toward the Earth, and that's that line across the Earth is your plane, and you can see where it cuts through the Earth. Therefore, if you're going to hit the Earth, you're going to hit along that red line somewhere. We call that line the risk corridor. That's the corridor where the impact will put people and life at risk. OK, now you remember that we said in the deflection, well, let's first say that's where you're going to hit in, in this particular example. All right, in a deflection we just talked about a moment ago, we're going to either slow down or speed up the asteroid a little bit. If we, and this is counterintuitive. Again, I'll leave this for the homework. But if we slow down the asteroid just a little bit, in fact, it will hit, it will arrive early, and it will end up hitting there to the right. If we slow it down a little bit more, it will arrive a little bit earlier, say four minutes early instead of two minutes early, and it would have hit there. 
or if we do this successfully, if we hit it properly and get the proper change in velocity, we'll end up eight minutes early and we'll go through the intersection before the Earth gets there. No problem. Conversely, if we do the opposite, if we slow it down, uh, rather if we speed up the asteroid, it will end up hitting, uh, it'll arrive late and it will hit, say, two minutes later. The Earth will have moved further to the right, four minutes and eight minutes. Okay, now that is the whole process of deflection. But the right way to look at this, the way to think of it, and I'm going to pull out my magic laser here. Think of that original impact point. There are two solutions to eliminating this threat to an impact. You need to either drag that impact point out to this point, somewhere out here where it no longer is a danger, or you drag it across this part of the Earth on the way to getting it behind the Earth. And again, a successful deflection. But in the process, you can see we're going to cross France, we're going to cross Germany, we're going to cross Poland, we're going to go into Russia with that impact point before it gets over here or as it gets over there. And so if something goes wrong, you can picture what happens here, okay, all of these people over here say, well, why don't you take it off the back side of the earth, right? And these people over here say, ah, nah, take it off the front side. Geopolitical challenge. If you're the prime minister of France and you're coming up for election or your party is in trouble, are you going to say, okay, just drag it across us if it's more cost effective to take it off the front? Who makes that decision? I'm going to tell you that you do. And that's why we're having this briefing. Okay, so obviously the answer here is those solutions are bad, you know, and that's what's good. Uh, we obviously want the latter, but this, I tell you, is an extremely difficult geopolitical decision. Okay, how do we deal with that? We've been dealing with it for the last, uh, since 2006 or so. So that's uh, almost 10 years now that we've been bringing this to the United Nations, the Association of Space Explorers, all the people you saw on the stage yesterday, many of the people out here in the audience, a part of Starmus, uh, Nobel laureates and others are part of this process that we have started. And we are calling for the United Nations to begin to organize to make a, a time-critical decision, life-saving decision to act when a threat materializes and is shown to exist. Now, of course, the United Nations is not everybody's favorite organization for making quick, crisp decisions, and hence you and I come into this. This is, where, this is why it is important that we're having this briefing. A planetary decision process the goal is to have in place an internationally established, timely process for acting when an impact threat arises. And that's simply a matter of time. Okay, to get there, we've got to have this coordination going on. The UN has to take up this process and ensure that this decision-making process is developed. And that is now in process and a skeleton form of the institutional structures which have to do this have already been established and they are working periodically now. The status, the work as I said is going on, it has gone to the General Assembly, kicked back down to the Outer Space Committee which is COPUS and this work is proceeding. But it is very academic. The reality when a threat comes up is going to be political and political Politicians do not like to make agreements ahead of time, which when the reality strikes, they live with. They want to debate it, and that's the problem. There's not going to necessarily be time to debate. If they debate, then we're in trouble. Who is they? The United Nations. The cowboys look at that guy down the bar with that huge hat, and they say, whoa, all hat and no cattle. But my God, what a hat. It's the only organization that represents everybody in the world. But let's get serious. The United Nations isn't itself going to make the decision. It's going to be the political leaders of our various nations who will make the decisions. And this is where you as crew come in. This is the purpose of this briefing. 
because our political leaders, as we have seen more recently and as we will see in the United States in November, the, our political leaders respond to us in one way or another. So we've got to get with it. In fact, that hat belongs to all of us. We're the ones who are going to have to hold our political leaders to account. We need to support them. We need to encourage them. We need to demand that they be prepared to act responsibly. And that's our job as crew of Spaceship Earth. So just to summarize here, the big issues to initiate any deflection, people and nations not initially at risk must accept a temporary risk as that impact point gets dragged across their nations and off the Earth in order to eliminate that threat for all. That is the essence, the nub of the geopolitical conundrum. And we're going to make a difference because we, the people of planet Earth, have to come together to realize this is our survival. And the big question is, do we, the people of Earth, have a collective survival instinct adequate to meet this geopolitical decision-making challenge? That's our job. You and I must hold, as crew of Spaceship Earth, we must hold our political leaders to account. To do that, we must educate ourselves and educate them so that this challenge is met. Okay? How do we do that? The only way we can do that is by education, by bringing the, the total crew of Spaceship Earth into this game. This is a game of survival. This is the game of extending this evolutionary process, magical evolutionary process that we're part of in our corner of the universe on ad, ad infinitum. That's the challenge we have. And so Asteroid Day, tomorrow, the 30th of June, every year, the United Nations, we hope, will be endorsing that this fall in the General Assembly. Every year, the 30th of June, the anniversary of the Tunguska impact in Siberia, a city killer. Okay, we're having this. I want you, as your homework assignment for tonight, to go on to asteroidday.org and sign the 100X Declaration. That says NASA and everybody else, we've got to find these asteroids that we don't know about yet at a rate 100 times what we've been finding them. And I'll tell you, all of the people, half of the people that you've heard talk in this conference that we're having here have already signed that 100X Declaration. So we need the crew of Spaceship Earth entirely to sign it. So please go on and do that. Read it. You, you're going to learn a lot. I want to emphasize again that your skin is in the game. This is going to require the participation of everyone. We realize this. We can't just convince our leaders to do something. We've got to have the public. This has got to be a planet-wide thing. I want you to think for a moment what we're doing. We have the capability and, in fact, the necessity together to very slightly alter very slightly modify the delicate clockwork of the solar system in order to enhance human and the survival of life on this planet so that, in fact, as people have said, we can all, our progeny can all go to the stars. So do your homework, live well and prosper. Thank you. <laughs>